Thanks very much, Dr. Gleef. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, my name is Tay. I'm one of the second year residents here at UBC. Um, welcome to my grand rounds. I'll be sharing the uh, contemporary perspectives of renal trauma um, and discuss uh, what we've been able to uh, find. Um, uh, the question of why I chose to uh, discuss this topic was initially out of personal interest. Um, I think a lot of it uh, came down to the fact that uh, when you're encountering patients with renal trauma, really they're coming in with uh, a spectrum of clinical presentation. Anyone with injuries that consider non-life-threatening to injuries significant enough to cause hemodynamic instability, uh, prompting uh, uh, intervention in the OR right away. It's also not a terribly rare entity, accounting for up to 5% of all traumatic injuries. Kidneys, of course, the most commonly genital urinary organ in trauma, despite their sort of, sort of uh, inherent defense mechanism, tucked away well away in the retroperitoneum, surrounded by the robust uh, uh, psoas musculature in a way, um, um, and uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, inherent uh, uh, cushioning from their perirenal fat. As surgeons, though, the, the ironic part is that when you're evaluating someone with renal injuries, you're looking for reasons to not operate. You're always, always balancing the risk of trauma nephrectomy to uh, renal salvage with increasing evidence that, you know, some selected, you know, even grade five injuries can be managed uh, conservatively. Uh, this question really, this balance uh, really comes into question. Um, but as surgeons, you also should be aware when uh, not taking someone to the operating room might not actually be successful and they might actually benefit from trauma nephrectomy. A lot of the literature in trauma is also retrospective, just based on their just, you know, on the virtue of the fact that uh, uh, they tend to be quite acute, certainly limited in the number of ret uh, prospective or randomized control trials they're able to design in this setting. But um, hopefully you'll be able to see uh, after this presentation that, you know, the numbers surrounding these uh, uh, data that are shaping the way we conceptualize renal injuries, the way we approach management uh, is actually quite robust. And I, and I certainly do believe that it's worth the review because I think there's been a, a, a significant shift in the way we conceptualize injuries, especially with the way we um, um, were able to characterize injuries based on the CT scan. This is an injury that was previously graded as a, a grade five, uh, meaning shattered kidney. No uh, loss of identifiable parenchymal uh, contour. Um, and this alone would have been a relative indication to explore the kidney when in fact, all it needed was a placement of a ureteral stent and a perinephric drain, which is now shown here. What you're seeing is uh, improved vascularity of the parenchyma. You can actually uh, appreciate the contour. You can see the stent in place and a reduction in size of the perinephric uh, walled off collection. In the end, this injury did not need to be explored and you could argue that uh, subjecting them to laparotomy and exploration might have actually resulted in this kidney being lost. The objective, uh, uh, objectives of this talk, I want to touch briefly on the evaluation of renal trauma. Someone comes into the trauma bay on a Friday, two in the morning. Um, how do we evaluate them? Um, how do we stage renal injuries? What are some relevant changes that have been developed uh, recently? Um, and why we want to stage it? Uh, why, why we want to stage them? What are the clinical implications of it? Um, and uh, discuss sort of the fundamental principles of renal trauma management. Uh, uh, with uh, increasing evidence that non-operative management is the standard of care in hemodynamically stable patients, when is it likely to fail? What are the indications for exploring the kidney in someone in extremis um, um, and looking at some of the uh, operative trends and surgical approach uh, from an R2 perspective? Evaluation of renal trauma, essentially the question you want to answer at this point is whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or not, because if you determine they're not, they uh, need an urgent trip to the operating room for laparotomy and exploration of the gerotis fascia. Uh, primarily, the resuscitation is focused around the ATLS principles, uh, uh, focusing on their airway, uh, uh, protecting their breathing, providing any circulatory support with hemodynamics, uh, uh, with the pressors or uh, uh, crystalloids or uh, uh, body products, looking for any sort of related disability or neurologic sequelae of the uh, injury mechanism and exposing them to delineate any head to toe injuries. Time permitting, um, history and physical exam should uh, certainly focus on eliciting the mechanism of injury. The two mechanisms are the, that are the culprits of renal trauma, uh, blunt uh, mechanism related to sort of a direct transmission of kinetic energy related to 
uh, rapid deceleration forces typically related to mechanisms like motor vehicle accidents or falls or assaults or contact injuries. Uh, uh, the blunt injuries tend to be the more predominant uh, cause of uh, uh, renal trauma. Penetrating mechanism, uh, just by uh, under virtue of the fact that they do have capacity to direct or deliver direct tissue damage related to stab wounds or gunshot wounds um, uh, are considered more serious, more rare compared to uh, blood mechanisms, but injuries that we certainly uh, uh, take with a, a elevated degree of severity. Some uh, suspicious findings that may elevate your um, um, uh, 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 suspicion for renal trauma, uh, looking for any evidence of sort of direct uh, significant uh, blow to the flanks resulting in ecchymosis or abrasions. With penetrating wounds, for example, uh, you can appreciate any entry and exit wounds. You can assess for any intra-abdominal uh, concomitant injuries or vascular injuries or any orthopedic injuries that might signal uh, a blow to the flank, including any rib fractures. People with renal injuries may or may not present with gross or microscopic hematuria, also bearing in mind that the presence of it does not necessarily suggest the severity of the renal injury. Imaging certainly plays an integral role in the evaluation of renal trauma. The gold standard modality in this situation is CT with intravenous contrast. Inclusion of delay phase is important to delineate collecting system injuries, and I'll touch on that on the next slide. Indications do exist for diagnostic CT. Um, first of all, they have to be stable enough to undergo CT. Uh, when you suspect renal injuries, that's when you would uh, uh, typically proceed with imaging. Uh, with mechanisms, uh, breaking down the indications by mechanism, specifically any blunt trauma with gross hematuria warrants imaging, any blunt trauma with microscopic hematuria in the setting of hypotension defined as systolic less than 90 warrants imaging, penetrating injury just based on their, uh, again, their capacity to deliver direct damage to the tissues, um, regardless of degree of hematuria, you would consider imaging and penetrating trauma. I mentioned, I touched up on delayed phase. The inclusion enables the identification of the collecting system injury. Sometimes you can infer this by the extravasation of contrast, perhaps as suggesting the, uh, the disruption in the collecting system. In the case of complete disruption or avulsion, you may actually see the absence of opacification uh, in the distal ureter. The indications for delayed phase uh, was uh, defined by Hardy and colleagues in 2013. They actually collected 126 uh, high-grade injuries, so grade four and five, regardless of mechanism and, and offered these indications. Um, any high-grade injuries or any grade three injuries with perinephric fluid. Um, and what they found was that the compliance with the delay phase is not perfect. Um, and non-compliance actually resulted in the one third of uh, um, collecting system injuries actually being missed on the initial diagnostic CT, a few of which actually eventually required a uh, ureteral stent placement. Using the same indications, Miller published an abstract in AUA uh, among 10 level one trauma institutions and the median compliance was actually 80%. Again, it wasn't perfect, but you have to bear in mind that um, delay, uh, the optimal delay phase, uh, according to literature, is 8 to 10 minutes, and that's a lot of time that you're asking uh, someone who might be hemodynamically compromised uh, to be in the CT scan away from the resuscitation. That you know brings us to the question, should you be repeating imaging uh, 48 out to 72 hours or routinely in patients renal, renal injury? The guideline would recommend, albeit with grade C evidence, that routine CT is indicated in grade four and five injuries, or if there's any clinical signs of uh, evolving complications like uh, a flank pain or uh, abdominal distension or ongoing signs of hemorrhage. But you know, using this uh, 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 definition, uh, there's a uh, emerging recent evidence that a lot of these, uh, a lot of the patients are actually being uh, uh, routinely imaged in the absence of symptoms. In a recent retrospective experience. Uh, of grade four and five injuries, one in eight uh, asymptomatic patients with renal injuries uh, undergoing routine CT scan uh, uh, resulted in uh, intervention. Interestingly, all of them had uh, collecting system injuries at the time of initial CT scan, and that was the only significant predictor uh, of intervention after repeat CT. Uh, subsequently, this was a study I, I believe was published uh, earlier this uh, last week, uh, up to 90% underwent routine CT in the absence of symptoms, and this was uh, 
uh, based on the urology consultation recommendation. Uh, this was a grade four blunt injury model. Uh, the cohort was actually prospectively collected in a single institution. 80% um, of those uh, receiving a routine C uh, repeat C imaging um, in the absence of symptoms actually received uh, intervention. Um, now the authors are reporting that the uh, routinely repeating imaging actually results in more urologic intervention, whether that was appropriately indicated or not, that is difficult to tell with the nature of the data, but certainly not surprisingly results in more CTs being performed per hospitalization, possibly subjecting them to more radiation exposure. And the ones who are presenting with traumatic injuries tend to be in the younger cohort. So that's something that you have to consider as well. But the important difference was that, uh, sorry, the important point was that there was no significant difference between root, uh, those undergoing routine imaging versus those not undergoing routine imaging uh, in their complication rate. So while the guidelines would suggest that you should consider repeat imaging in these search, uh, situations, uh, the modern literature would suggest that a lot of people are undergoing CT in the absence of symptoms, possibly at the expense of uh, uh, being overtreated. Once you evaluate renal hey, trauma- Hey, okay, sorry, did they describe what kind of interventions that those people did receive? That's a good question. Uh, so uh, in the initial study, I discussed uh, all the intervention were uh, ureteral stents, six out of six uh, uh, individuals. Uh, in the later study, uh, uh, they probably did specify. I'll have to look into that. But essentially, they, they kept just receiving them, reseating them, even though there was nothing going worse clinically. Exactly. And just they, got, they got worried by the CT and decided to do something. Well, that's exactly it. Yeah, they saw whatever sort of progression, at least based on their CT finding, uh, uh, in fact, when they were completely asymptomatic. So they treated the CT and not the patient. E exactly, exactly. Gotcha. Um, uh, we have a very good way of staging renal injuries, and there's a good reason to do so. I'll get into that. But uh, the scale that we use is the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma. This was a, a scale proposed by Moore and colleagues in 1989. These were a group of experts who you know, really uh, back in the day when the CT wasn't, uh, uh, the technology around it wasn't as good, uh, provided sort of a, what they uh, thought was an anatomic description of uh, 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 the most mild form of renal injury to the most severe form, uh, stage grade one to five. Um, this not only facilitated their research, but also sort of a, a, a quick uh, conceptualization how uh, significant or how severe they should uh, conceive uh, or perceive these injuries to be. Um, as any good clinical staging should do, um, each increasing grade should have meaningful clinical implications for each stage, which is what the, the scale actually delivers, and I'll get into that. Uh, providing some context into this grade one um, renal injury defined by contusion, as you can see with this uh, sort of a hyper a hypo attenuation uh, of the parenchyma uh, corresponding to contusion, this is a grade one injury. Uh, hematoma confined within the capsule, subcapsular, you can actually see this displacing the, uh, uh, the left kidney anteriorly with some retention of contrast as well. Grade two injury is characterized by the presence of perinephric hematoma extending beyond the capsule. You see a parenchymal laceration that is less than one centimeters, characteristically does not involve the collecting system. Grade three injury also refers to parenchymal laceration with some element of perinephric hematoma, but the difference here being that the parenchymal laceration is greater than one centimeters. Also characteristically does not involve the collecting system. This is not a delay phase, so you're, you're not able to tell, but um, I was told that there was no collecting system injury. Grade four is when you run into a collecting system involvement, any parenchymal laceration resulting in it. Um, you can see in the initial CT scan, there's uh, certainly a lot of uh, uh, insult going on. In the subsequent delay phase, you can see the extravasation of contrast. The, um, interestingly, the original scale recognizes as a vascular injury of the renal hilum as a grade four injury. And I'll talk about why this was a, a potentially a problematic classification. Grade five injury, obviously being the most uh, uh, severe form of renal injury, refers to complete devascularization related to uh, uh, the main uh, the injury to the main renal vasculature. The white arrow pointing to uh, what appears to be a, 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 an occlusion or a dissection of the left proximal main renal artery, resulting in complete devascularization of the kidney. And of course, we have to recognize that shattered kidney with loss of any identifiable parenchyma uh, is the most severe form of renal injury.
And, you know, the reason we we have relied on uh, 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 staging these injuries um, um, over the years is that the, it does deliver a meaningful clinical implication for any increase in grade. And these have been uh, looked at by three seminal papers uh, sort of after 10 to 15 years after the, the original scale was conceived, starting with Centucci in 2001. This was a retrospective single institution experience in San Francisco. They collected almost 2,500 uh, renal injuries, and they demonstrated that every increase in grade actually increased the odds of nephrectomy sevenfold. In 2006, Kwan and colleagues in uh, uh, in their using the National Trauma Data Bank. Uh, this is a voluntary repository uh, concerning all trauma admissions. Although they had to um, use the a different scale uh, to um, called AIS, and they they had to indirect uh, directly map this to uh, uh, the renal injury scale. In any event, they collected almost uh, 8,500 uh, 8, renal injuries from 94 to 2003 and further demonstrated that every increase in grade, regardless of blunt or penetrating mechanism, increases the risk of nephrectomy. Uh, Sherry had in 2007, a comparatively uh, a less uh, cohort, but uh, half of them were actually collected prospectively. And, and perhaps the most uh, organic way to approach uh, validity of the scale because they were directly able to ascribe injuries uh, uh, using the, the, the more criteria. And they further corroborated by uh, the finding that injury grade was the strongest independent predictor of nephrectomy. It's... Um, it's not to say that the original scale wasn't without, uh, 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 there wasn't room for improvement. For example, we talked about the heterogeneity of the high grade injuries, especially the grade four injuries. Um, you're looking at anywhere from collecting system injury involvement to the vascular involvement of the renal hilum. Uh, conceptually, uh, a very sort of two distinct uh, injuries that uh, you might have to manage. And um, with what we've been able to sort of establish with the improvement in the techniques and the way we were able to scan these patients uh, in trauma settings, we began to recognize concepts or constructs like segmental vascular injuries that was uh, certainly not recognized in the original scale and also providing some clarity around the term shattered um, around the grade five injury because there was a lot of variation in how people would define this. Enter Buckley and McGannich in 2011, who defined the grade four and five injuries, uh, uh, trying to address those questions on the previous slide. And they formally proposed these uh, uh, based on expert opinion. Uh, they modified grade four injury to uh, uh, involvement of the uh, degree of any collecting system injury involvement, uh, including a disruption of the UPJ. Um, and they actually uh, upgraded the, the vascular injury involving the main renal vasculature to uh, grade five and, in, uh, and replaced it with segmental vascular injury to denote grade four injury. And why was this a significant change? Because the, the authors, the very same authors who uh, proposed a revision actually posited that the revised grade four reclassification as a result, largely these will be managed with active surveillance. Uh, these no longer represent sort of a same degree of injury as grade five, perhaps even providing a better distinction in this uh, in the staging scale that we know it actually uh, works and predicts nephrectomy and this was sort of a this was not an entirely unsub unsubstantiated claim because earlier the same authors found in their 25 exp 25 year experience using the old uh, the the original criteria that isolated grade four injuries that were able to be managed non-operatively um, walked away with acceptable salvage rate as well um, Malib in 2014 subsequently used the blunt model and they were able to manage 90% of the segmental vascular injury with observation alone. This was a single institution from Harborview uh, from 2003 and 2010, where they looked at all grade through three to five blunt injuries and achieved the renal salvage rate of 85 and uh, 85%. Uh, that was the same definition as the one that Buckley used defined as more than 25% of the overall renal function on a renogram. Now with, again, we're encountering sort of all spectrum of injuries that we haven't been able to encounter before. And now they're recognizing a uh, uh, segmental infarction and uh, even uh, distinguishing this from the segmental vascular injury. Image on the left, what you're seeing is a sort of a normal enhancement of the one of the segmental arteries supplying the right uh, kidney, uh, followed by sort of the uh, lack of opacification, uh, possibly uh, alluding to a vascular injury related to dissection. Um, 
What you're seeing in the right image is uh, evidence of an uh, infarction, uh, wedge-shaped hypoenhancement compared to otherwise well-vascularized kidney. And the question is, should we really distinguish them? And it turns out it might be helpful to consider infarction as a, maybe a lower grade of injury because in a recent study, uh, uh, Kiani in 2020 used the MyGuts a cohort that's a multi-institution collaborative effort of 14 level one trauma centers where they collected 550 high-grade renal injuries prospectively. Um, and actually found that isolated infarction in the absence of any um, 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 evidence of active uh, vascular injury requires fewer interventions for hemostasis compared to non-isolated uh, infarction uh, uh, with significant difference. One can argue that uh, the finding of a devitalized segment or uh, uh, evidence of infarction, even greater than 25% of infarction, does not necessarily predict intervention for hemostasis that was uh, found by Zemp in 2018 and Kiani in 2019, uh, but does predict a poor long-term uh, long -term renal function. So in terms of, in the way of acute interventions, this uh, isolated infarction may not warrant uh, urgent intervention. However, uh, the function on the other hand might be something that we need to uh, 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 be aware of. So what were, what was the outcome of reclassifying all these injuries? That do we should, does it even really matter? And the same authors who proposed uh, the revisions in the first place that included all renal injuries, they actually graded all of them by the original criteria and all of them by the revised criteria and found no difference in rate of nephrectomy between the 1989 and the revised criteria. And we know that the original scale was validated before by those uh, three papers that we discussed. So the revised scale uh, possibly uh, uh, preserves the strength of the scale. What's interesting, though, is um, uh, in 2019, Ballon Landa, uh, using a prospective cohort in their single institution, found that uh, uh, using the revised criteria, uh, the majority of the injuries are actually uh, uh, not changed at all. It's partly, be it's mostly because the the revisions do not. In uh, uh, make any changes to the grades one to three injuries. It was just the uh, grade four and five injuries they modified. Uh, 50 of injuries that were upstage, the majority of them were actually up, uh, upgrading of grade three to grade four injuries solely based on the uh, 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 secondary to the inclusion of the segmental uh, injury process. And using either uh, original scale or the revised scale significantly associated with intervention for hemostasis. Interesting, though, uh, 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 using uh, plotting uh, um, sort of the need for intervention using the the revised scale and the original scale. Uh, the revised the propo uh, the revised uh, propositions actually performed uh, a better in terms of uh, separating the need for intervention for hemostasis compared to the original scale at a, a significantly different level based on their area under the curve. Um, some anecdotal or uh, uh, findings they documented as well. All nephrectomies were performed for only revised grade four or five injuries, perhaps uh, again, hinting at the fact that now the sort of the injury grade allocation is more appropriate. Uh, no embolization was attempted for revised grade five injury. Uh, interestingly though, they also report that 30% of the C uh, report only 30% of the CT reports actually alluded to any form of a renal injury staging, um, highlighting that maybe uh, perhaps it's not as uh, uh, widely uptaken as uh, um, as we would like to believe. In retrospect, though, the American Association for uh, 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 Surgeons and Trauma actually uh, uh, published their official revisions to the original scale in 2018, and it does include many, if not all, of the changes proposed by Buckley in 2011. Uh, in 2020, Kiani actually compared uh, the performance of the revised scale to the original scale, but they did not find any significant difference in performance. That could be partly attributable to the fact that the cohort, including Kiani, were exclusively high grades of grade three, four, and five injuries, not all grades like the previous paper in Ballon Landa. Perhaps at that point, it was not uh, giving sort of a, a greater distinction on whether uh, the intervention would be predicted. I think the bottom line, however, though, is that the, these revisions do exist, and, and we should be familiar with these changes as, as urologists. Moving on to reviewing the fundamental principles of renal trauma management, I wanted to, you know, emphasize the fact that, you know, really your goal is to determine whether they're stable or not, because if they're not, they're going to the operating room uh, for exploration. But if they're stable, then you should be considering non-operative, non-invasive management, but it's not, the management of renal trauma is not as black and white. And I think 
uh, a lot of the questions, even myself, uh, you know, going through the search uh, and prepare, preparation of the talk is, you know, there are a lot of extraneous factors that conceivably contribute to the, your management decision, you know, some of which it may include the injury grade, the injury mechanism or the characteristics of the injury. And really, the, this is uh, sort of what the, the um, uh, contemporary research has really focused on, identifying injuries that, you know, might not warrant that there is no obvious indication to explore, but it also uh, doesn't uh, feel right to just sit on them and manage them conserv conservatively. And now we're sort of adopting this uh, risk stratified approach to injury. What you're seeing here um, is a number of high risk criteria that Doogie in 2010 actually proposed might actually helps, help us uh, conceptualize high risk injuries. What you see in the first image is a swirl of a, a, a sort of a contrast extravasation that denotes uh, intravascular contrast extravasion or ICE. What you're seeing in the second image is uh, uh, six, uh, it's uh, 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 estimating the size of the perirenal hematoma size. You obtain this by uh, uh, finding the axial view that gives you the, the biggest dimension of the hematoma. Uh, you're um, giving yourself a, a ruler uh, from the capsule, level of the capsule to the uh, to the furthest point of the hematoma. Anything exceeding three and a half centimeters is classically recognized as a high-risk criteria. What you're seeing in this image is a complex hematoma, uh, uh, mainly in that it's extending medially. You can see that it actually tracks anteriorly to the uh, aorta. Another example of complex hematoma, you can actually see it extending all the way down to the level of the bifurcation. What you're seeing, this is uh, sort of determining the laterality of the hematoma, uh, uh, draw an imaginary line crossing the renal hilum, transect it, or, or draw a perpendicular line to it. Anything lateral to it is considered a lateral hematoma, anything medial, obviously medial. What the hypothesis is that medial laceration is perhaps a more high-risk injury based on their uh, proximity to um, uh, the important vascular structures. And uh, in their experience, uh, Dugi found that uh, in grade three and five injuries, uh, compared to injuries with zero to one uh, 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 risk criteria, having two or three risk cr criteria actually increases their odds of intervention for hemostasis 26 fold. When you have all three, that's 122 fold. Uh, sort of going along the line with the risk stratified approach, uh, ZAMP in 2018 published a journal, Canadian series, uh, using the Alberta Trauma Registry, where they included the blunt injury only that was all grades and further corroborated that the size of the hematoma area and diameter and the injury grade uh, of note, this was the, using the original criteria, independently associated with interventions for hemostasis a multivariate analysis. They actually go on further to offer that hematoma exceeding six centimeters might actually even be a better cutoff, providing better sort of separability in, uh, in predicting interventions. Sort of the, the result of using this risk stratified approach was now the development of a trauma nomogram. This was developed by Kiani, again, using the MyGOTS uh, prospective cohort of all high grade injuries, uh, devised a calibrated nomogram based on uh, uh, Canada predictors uh, with a significant univariate uh, associations. Uh, really the point of the nomogram was to generate a probability of requiring intervention for hemostasis, uh, including embolization and any open related renal surgery. Uh, uh, important caveat though, though, is that this nomogram was based on data obtained from patients stable enough for initial CT. They excluded in their, um, in their development patients that were unstable for diagnostic CT. This is an example of the nomogram, how you will normally approach it. And um, the predictors that made it to the nomogram mechanism, uh, whether they're hypotensive, whether they have any uh, associated injuries or any vascular extravasation on their CT scan or any complex or perilino hematoma and distance, you can plot the points and uh, gives you an idea of what percentage, uh, uh, or what probability you may need to intervene. So why don't we walk through an example? Let's say someone comes in with a penetrating injury. They are not hypotensive, no abdominal injuries, no evidence of contrast extravasation, no perirenal hematoma, and they have a hematoma measuring three centimeters that gives a total point of 59. That corresponds to less than 10% of requiring embolization or open renal surgery. Whereas if you have someone coming in with a blunt injury, they are hypotensive. They do have concomitant injuries. They do have uh, uh, ice um, with evidence of perilino hematoma, and let's say their hematoma measures nine centimeters, which is 
big. Uh, their point of 156.5, that's a probability almost 90% of requiring some sort of intervention for hemostasis. But the questions or the or, or you know the the breaks uh, the mental breaks you should you know place using nomograms like this is that it absolutely does not replace your clinical judgment. Uh, the question you have to ask yourself is at what what threshold do you intervene? Do you th uh, intervene at fifty uh, or ninety? Uh, that unfortunately we don't. Uh, again, I think that goes on to show that it's your clinical judgment more than anything that uh, 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 goes into the the management decision. And also the fact that the nomogram was based on a um, uh, uh, data from patients that were stable enough to undergo diagnostic CT, whether this applies to patients uh, uh, um, that are not stable to undergo CT, you would argue that this nomogram will be, uh, using this nomogram will be futile. Um, and, more, and, and also importantly, it does not uh, uh, predict interventions for uh, collecting system injuries. Speaking of which, the management collecting system injuries have been tricky. There is not a lot, a lot of a good evidence uh, guiding sort of uh, when to stem versus uh, when to watch. Um, just reiterating the fact that delayed phase is uh, imperative um, in delineating collecting system injuries. In a recent meta-analysis by Kiani in 2018 that included uh, uh, injuries uh, based on the original criteria and the revised scale, collecting system injuries were found in almost half of, more than half of grade four and five injuries, um, resulting in ureteral stem placement in almost 30% of all collecting system injuries. So not all of them uh, do get stented. Again, the indi contemporary indications for stent or drainage are unclear. The literature actually uh, uh, likes to report that up to 90% of the spontaneous resolution rate with collecting system injury, but this was on a, based on a single uh, uh, retrospective study uh, of 61 uh, injuries where uh, they um, there was about 36 uh, patients with collecting system injuries. 33 were managed expectantly. Three ended up receiving stents with complete resolution. This is why the number 90% comes from. It's interesting to note that there's a, certainly a variable threshold to stent, even among, uh, just on the basis of your training, whereby the urologists favor observation for isolated collecting system injury compared to trauma surgeons. Urologists rely less on ureteral stents for isolated collecting system versus trauma surgeons. But this was an experience. This was a survey of experience, not uh, 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 not directly, you know, what uh, did happen in a real practice. But I think it's interesting to discuss this because um, I think uh, that goes on to show a lot of the decision to place stents where it has been uh, more clinical and based on their training and their comfort level more than indication driven. Uh, in fact, the only sort of documented independent predictors of requiring stent were fever, more than 38.5 in a setting of suspected sepsis when you have ruled out other sources of infection and development of symptoms like flank pain suggestive of a ureteral clot obstruction. This was on a single institution prospective study, uh, but it only included grade four blunt injuries. Uh, interestingly, too, sort of highlighting the fact that, you know, does routine uh, uh, repeat CT scan really change management? Almost 50% of these uh, stem were placed in the absence of symptoms. And like Dr. Chu also alluded to earlier, the decision to stem was just based on CT findings alone. It's, you know, just based on the uh, nature of the evidence we have available, we can't tell whether these would have resolved on their own or whether we just found something that um, uh, happen to capture a, perhaps a progressing urinoma uh, uh, in the absence of symptoms uh, and resulted in intervention. Moving, um, but one thing that we do need to recognize is that the collecting system injury does uh, 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 tend to present with more complications than uh, uh, than its other grade four injury cohort segmental vascular injuries. And perhaps the only uh, follow up uh, um, literature we have on uh, renal trauma, Winters reported their single institution from Harvard View experience, 636 grade three and five injuries. Um, they noted that 25% of the collecting system injuries required readmission. Majority of them were actually requiring urologic diagnosis, and a few of them resulted in adjuvant procedures. Uh, in, when looking at segmental vascular injuries, only 13% of them had urologic diagnosis, none of whom required a, a adjuvant uh, procedure. Interestingly, though, finding of extravasation on CT was not a predictor of poor functional outcome in grade four or five uh, blunt injuries. Um, may suggest uh, uh, collecting system injuries actually may be amenable to delayed intervention, but of course at the risk of uh, incurring complications or uh, uh, symptoms for patients.
Now, non-operative management is the standard of the care in renal trauma in stable patients, and there has been a lot of uh, evolving evidence that this is uh, applicable in not only um, uh, all injury grades, but also in select high-grade injuries as well. Non-operative management generally associated with lower mortality compared to ones undergoing surgery. Important caveats, however, is that uh, the definition of non-operative management is variable among studies and also mortality difficult to adjust for given that, you know, you could argue the ones who needed uh, intervention in the first place comes in with more significant injury and uh, uh, that alone could have contributed to, to their mortality. In perhaps the most uh, uh, organic definition, non-operative failure, Berlin reported their retrospective National Trauma Data Bank experience, almost 20,000 renal injuries, actually defined non-operative management as absence of any in, uh, renal uh, uh, injury-related intervention less than 24 hours of admission, the failure of non-operative management, as in requiring intervention uh, more, uh, um, within 24 hours, uh, was highest renal injury grade, um, highest non-renal injury grade, as well as a penetrating injury mechanism. It's interesting though, though the ones who failed and ones undergoing open intervention, uh, the, um, the majority of whom required uh, open intervention actually resulted in nephrectomy. And this was consistent with what Al, Al Hetchy found in their 2020 uh, um, uh, publication of a, a, a non-operative management and penetrating injuries. Uh, that repair, like in renal raffi or exploration, was actually infrequently used in failed uh, non-operative management setting in favor of nephrectomy. Looking at the operative trends in renal trauma, um, certainly not surprising, even in blunt and penetrating injuries, the overall incidence of nef trauma nephrectomy is decreasing for fa uh, in favor of embolization. But if you actually look at closely sort of the, the, the evolving trends of renal tra uh, operative trends in renal trauma, nephrectomy continues to be performed at, at a high rate. Starting with Wessels in 2003, more than 6,000 renal injuries, multi-state experience retrospective, they actually looked at 123 million in population data uh, spanning 18 states. Um, again, this was a renal injury grade converted from the, uh, their discharge diagnosis. They found that uh, of those requiring renal exploration, 64% of them resulted in nephrectomy. But again, the, this number could have been inflated uh, because the authors were not able to identify any damage control situations where just on the virtue of the fact that they were being explored for other intra-abdominal injuries that they had to uh, uh, perform renal exploration and pr uh, uh, provide a nephrectomy. In 2013, a more recent uh, uh, National Trauma Data Bank experience where they mapped uh, AIS grade to the, uh, the original uh, injury criteria, the one, um, they actually reported also almost one third of grade one and three injuries requiring operative intervention uh, underwent nephrectomy. Again, this number could have been inflated by the fact that the, these were under damage control situations, but uh, difficult to tell. Continuing with the reason, more recent operative trends, uh, Kiani using their MyGuts uh, uh, cohort of 431 grade three to five injuries. This was actually using the more, uh, uh, the original uh, injury grade. 84 of them underwent open surgeries, but of those 84, 55 of them received nephrectomy. That was the operation of choice. Um, Al Hitchie in 2020, using almost 2,000 uh, penetrating renal injuries, um, 82% of them underwent immediate operation within four hours of admission. About half of them received nephrectomy. What's interesting, though, is that another 42% underwent uh, operation but received no intervention. Um, maybe uh, arguing to the fact, and they don't specify why that was the case, uh, maybe arguing the fact that maybe they were unnecessarily explored. Predictors of nephrectomy have been well documented. Um, right in 2006, uh, found the renal injury grade um, and the need for laparotomy for non-renal injuries, sort of uh, adding to the claim that uh, perhaps all of these nephrectomies are occurring in the setting of other intra-abdominal injuries necessitating uh, their own exploration. And the management is actually driven by uh, uh, by the non-renal injuries and the renal injuries themselves. Uh, uh, there's a, a cautioning that potentially salvaged kidneys may be getting sacrificed um, uh, when these uh, when the other injuries are being explored. And they were able to uh, indirectly confirm this when um, they adjusted the relative risk of nephrectomy, included all grades initially, but when they took the grade five injury out, the relative risk of nephrectomy in the setting of bowel surgery or splenic injury or liver uh, injury actually all increased. Davis subsequently, much smaller study, however, uh, uh, found that shock, and uh, although the definition is unclear related to this, and 24-hour transfusion requirement predicted nephrectomy.
why do we care about the uh, uh, um, unnecessary nephrectomy? I mean, for obvious reasons, I, um, you, you want to balance the, the benefit of renal salvage to ones who actually need it. And you, you certainly want to avoid cases where they could have avoided a, a trauma nephrectomy. This is an Anderson paper in 2020, uh, where they actually found, uh, actually uh, collected over 3,000 uh, trauma nephrectomies being performed from 2007 and 2016 all high-grade injuries, grade three to five. In their unadjusted analysis, they reported mortality of nephrectomy was significantly higher than those not undergoing nephrectomy. But when they adjusted for age, their mechanism of injury, transfusion requirements, and so the, sort of other index of injury severity, there was an 82% increase in odds of death. And again, um, uh, um, sort of corroborating that uh, unnecessary nephrectomy should most certainly be avoided which is why it's important to review the absolute and relative indications for renal exploration. Absolute indications, including hemodynamic instability related to renal bleeding or intraoperative finding of expanding pulsatile or retroperitoneal hematoma. Um, relative indications, including uh, inability to uh, completely uh, stage injuries, uh, finding of ex extensive devitalized renal parenchyma or uh, evidence of vascular injury or urinary extravasation. Notice that uh, the indications for exploration does not include penetrating injuries, and there has certainly been a shift in this as well, uh, with a lot of um, uh, with uh, emerging evidence uh, with uh, with either gunshot wounds or stab wounds that are very select in, uh, penetrating injuries can be avoided. El Hitchin 2020 uh, found that uh, 300 and out of the 330 penetrating injuries managed non-operatively, 317 were successfully managed with expected management. Again, uh, increasing injury grade and concomitant abdominal injuries were likely to predict a risk of non-operative failure. When approaching um, um, exploration and you're considering trauma nephrectomy under um, uh, or exploration in uh, appropriate settings, the surgical approach is typically midline and transperitoneal. Uh, the question of whether you should routinely obtain early vascular control, meaning uh, uh, isolating the main renal vessels before you enter gerodous fascia, before you disrupt the inherent tamponade that it provides. Um, it, the, this approach is largely historic and initially based on studies that are compared to the historic controls. Um, in perhaps the only uh, randomized prospective data I encountered in renal trauma literature, there was no difference in nephrectomy rate or blood loss uh, between the, uh, the early vascular control group and the non-early vascular control group. And even in those who require, uh, who, uh, um, um, uh, 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 achieved, uh, obtained or early vascular control, only 12% actually required temporary vascular occlusion, possibly at the expense of uh, increased operative time. Interestingly, too, also in a survey, this was a, there was a practice variation in that urologists obtained vascular control more frequently than trauma surgeons, but this was based on a survey finding. So how would you go about obtaining vascular control if you do need? Typically, you a midline laparotomy you reflect the transverse colon uh, to the chest, uh, retract the bowels away. Uh, when entering the retroperitoneum, you want to incise over the eye, um, generally incise over the aorta. But if there's a, a issue with the visibility due to the presence of a uh, retroperitoneal hematoma, inferior mesenteric vein can be a useful landmark. You make an incision medial to that. Um, you typically control the left uh, vessels first, followed by the right, um, and then you enter a uh, gerotus fascia laterally. If you do need to use vascular inclusion, you uh, uh, try to limit the warm ischemia time to less than a half hour. Um, briefly, the principles of reconstruction renal raffi um, uh, want to uh, establish early vascular control. Um, you want the maximum exposure and hemostasis. You debride any non-viable parenchyma. Make sure you're performing watertight closure of the collecting system. It needs to be reapproximated. Parenchyma defect uh, should be reapproximately tightly, um, and you can augment this with any omental interposition flip flap uh, from surrounding intra-abdominal organs. And typically, recommend placing a retroperitoneal drain. Um, in summary, renal trauma encompasses a wide spectrum of clinical presentations. Sometimes you're making a very uh, a timely decision based on their uh, hemodynamic status. Uh, the way we stage injuries is well validated and predicts the need for nephrectomy, and we should be aware of its contemporary revisions. 
Uh, also consider repeat imaging in patients with collecting system injuries on their initial diagnostic CT and or symptomatic. I think a lot of the data suggests a lot of asymptomatic people undergo uh, intervention just based on their CT findings alone. So we should be uh, mindful of that. Non-operative management is the standard of care in uh, stable patients, but the absolute indication for exploration include a hemodynamic instability or intraoperatively um, you find expanding or pulsatile retroperitoneal hematoma. Early vascular control is historic, so when you're exploring, uh, you may or may not need to uh, perform this. Um, and the fractomy continues to be performed at a high rate, even in contemporary data in patients uh, requiring exploration in general. Uh, I'd like to personally extend my gratitude to Dr. Brian Mason, uh, despite short notice, uh, was enthusiastic about reviewing the slide, so uh, really uh, I'm indebted to him.